On this week's show, we're going to be discussing overseas trusts, pretty much the bazooka version of asset protection. Now, a lot of you guys have been calling me and, you know, I'm totally fine uh, taking these shorter introduction strategy calls for you guys for signing up for the Hui Do Pipeline Club. Sign up for that at simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. But a comment, a question that comes up is like, you know, I've got a property or two. My net worth is under $500,000. What do I do? do? I do these LLCs and series LLCs and all that's fine. But once you get above a million, dollars net worth, you're going to want something different. And quite frankly, those LLCs and series LLCs ideas, there's a little bit of kitty stuff and they work in theory and they're not entirely foolproof. I think it's fine. I'm not giving any legal advice here, but if your net worth is under half a million or even half, even a million, honestly, you don't really have much to lose. And oftentimes the best defense for a lawsuit is being broke and them not having too much of a prize to go after. So today's podcast is again, talking about overseas trust it's going to be also in webinar version so if you guys haven't checked out the youtube version sign up there and click the bell to subscribe and you get signed up for a quarterly prize there but you also get to check out the slides that came along with this recording so if you guys are interested in implementing the strategy yourself it is very expensive and look if you're not a million dollar net worth guy it's ain't for you but i think that a lot of people are going to be heading in that direction i mean most of my you guys my investors you guys are able to save $30,000 after your day job and all your expenses. And a lot of you guys are able to save 50 or $100,000 every year. So in just in a matter of years, it'll be over a million dollars off to the next four and a half million dollar milestone, which everybody talks about. And this type of asset protection is exactly what you're probably looking for. In fact, this is sort of a strategy that I use today for myself being out in the spotlight and being at a pedestal to be taking pawn shots of frivolous lawsuits. So enjoy the show and if you guys have any questions or serious about getting this type of asset protection shoot me an email lane at simplepassivecashflow.com and we'll see you guys later Want to introduce Doug and Brian? Why don't you guys say hi and introduce yourselves and then we'll get kind of rolling. Hey, I'm Brian. Hey, my name is Douglas Lodmel and I'm the founding and managing partner of Lodmel Lodmel and we do nothing but asset protection. So that's all I've done for 20 plus years is help people protect their assets. Um, so I've worked with tons of real estate investors like yourself, as well as every other imaginable specialty and profession that you can think of. I work with Brian and together we're going to just talk about asset protection and Lane asked us to kind of start with LLCs because that's a big thing. And we do use LLCs. They're very functional in our system. The question is, is, you know, is that enough? Can I just use an LLC? So Brian, you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I'll jump into that. And I'm Brian Bradley and I'm licensed all over the state. And I got into asset protection as a trial lawyer on the litigation side. I look at it as what actually happens in court. And so that's why I like setting up and things that actually aren't maybe protection and is really strong protection, which is what we're going to be talking about today, especially for you investors or if you're accredited, have that 1 million net worth or a little bit more. This is kind of where, what we're talking about for you guys. First, thanks for putting this all together, Lane. I appreciate that. Letting us talk to your group. If you want to lead off about what's going on with LLCs, why they're weak, they're a good starting point but what is it that's wrong with them? What's missing with them? And so as Doug said, the LLCs are limited liability companies. It's a good entry point to establish some basic form of protection. Doug and I, we both use them. And then as clients grow, the level of protection then grows as you grow. So you need something that grows with you. Um, and it's kind of like the adage where you start is not where you're going to end up. The same thing with LLCs. As you grow, what's going to happen? You're going to add another LLC, another LLC, another LLC. That's just going to start creating a massive mess. But you also need to understand a lot of the pros and cons. There's weaknesses to everything. And generally, I think what most people hear is just the pros about LLCs, but not understand about how they actually function. And so LLCs say it right in their name. They're limited. They don't hide the fact that they have just limited protection, but they're affordable and you're going to get some limited personal liability out of them. A weakness is that it's protection or it's what's called a veil can be pierced. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this term, piercing the corporate veil. And you have a lot of unfriendly states like California, in New York and a lot of other ones that do not like to honor the limited liability protection and they're easy to pierce. And then depending on the state and the jurisdiction, you can either have really strong charging orders or horrible ones. And so what a charge
overarching order is referring to is how much a creditor can actually collect from you, the member who owns that LLC. And so good state charging orders are going to have the charging order being the sole remedy. Basically, it's saying that a creditor with a judgment against the member, you, the owner, is going to be entitled only to that limited remedy or that charging order. That's it. But LLCs have limitations and drawbacks. You know, states have started differentiating between themselves and just how serious they're going to take asset protection. Like California, they're basically termed non-asset protection friendly states. And same with New York and a lot of other states. So if you're really interested in true protection, it's important to understand what these limitations are and what are some of the solutions around them that we provide. And so as case laws developed over the decades, we're seeing courts completely disregard the charging order only remedy and then directly reach LLC assets. So whatever assets you put into those LLCs that you're thinking you're protecting, courts are just piercing straight through them and then letting those assets be reached by creditors. And this is becoming really common. It's just called piercing the corporate veil. Maybe you can do a little example on this. We all think we're getting tricky here by using these Nevada or Wyoming or Delaware LLCs, but maybe explain how it doesn't really protect you of that charging order protection or how you can pierce that and now your charging order protection. Goes. Yeah, Doug will hit that on a deeper yeah. level later okay. in the presentation, but a lot of these are created state statutorily for state residents. And so you're having a lot of out-of-state residents using, we'll just use California as an example, using Nevada Asset Protection Trust or Californians using Delaware or Texas or Nevada LLCs. And the courts is saying, well, your assets are here in California. You're being sued here in California. Why do I care that you created something in another state? The tort laws that are going to be applied are going to be applied in the state where you're being sued anyways. And so they just completely disregard those entities. And that's one of the major weaknesses. And we'll get into a little bit more detail of that in the presentation as we start going through domestic versus offshore. And then I can break down some of the case law with Doug on that just to show, you know, like we're not just making this up. And one thing before I shut up, again, this is for accredited investors and above. And especially if you're in a high risk profession, like a doctor, you got a lot of liability. I am ter- personally very terrible at keeping bank accounts and credit cards straight. I think it's a complete waste of time for me to worry about that. So that's why I like something like this. And someone had set up something previously very similar to what this is, but there's a little bit of issues with it. Maybe you guys will go into it, but kind of what I'm doing to kind of protect myself. Again, I'm the general partner in all my deals. So my butt is kind of out there and I'm obviously very public facing. So this is just what I'm doing. It may not be for you, but like how Brian's saying, you'll grow into this as your net worth gets one, two million and above. Yeah. yeah, and I'll piggyback off of that even is it's even stageable because I don't want you to scare away a lot of your members to where let's say they just need an LLC. But at the end of this, like, oh, hey, I really want to grow into this later on. You start and you scale in LLC, asset management, limited partnership that then goes into it and the bridge trust later on, which would touch upon how it scales out later on. So we don't need to scare away everybody. <laughs> so to get back to the, you know, the LLC, it's just you have single member LLC exemptions and that's become a major concern. Some states like California have shown just a consistent propensity to be hell bent on disregarding them. And they're just determined to pierce all of your LLCs. And so the LLC is a good starting point. I don't want to scare people away. It gets property out of your name. We use them. The last thing you want to do is own anything personally, but what's missing is the full strength that you really want. And that we're going to be talking about today, you know, like the offshore asset protection component to it when you get to that million dollar net worth mark. And so we're going to break this down for you more. And Doug's going to jump in with our slide presentation. I'm just going to interject here and there. Okay, great. Well, LLCs are great. And they are definitely the first step. Just like anything, though, they're just limited in in their ability to take you all the way. So really the question then is, what do we do after you've got your LLCs? Well, from there, we look at a tool called an Asset Management Limited Partnership. You can think of this as a holding company. This is where your LLC goes. So in your current model, if if you just have LLCs and you're the member, that's where the breakdown occurs. In this model, you're gonna actually have a holding company that's the member. So it's gonna hold your LLC interest, whether you own 100% of the LLC, whether you own 10%, whether you own 1%, it doesn't matter, whatever percentage you own. It can hold other companies, it can hold stock, cash, any kind of securitized assets. And here we get a choice because Brian made a really good point. If you have real estate in California and you create a Nevada LLC thinking, oh, I'm going to get all this great Nevada protection. And then you put California real estate in it. We can absolutely tell you for sure a California court is not going to apply Nevada law because it's holding California real estate. This changes though when we use a holding company because the holding company is not 
in California doing business. It's whatever state we put it in. We use Arizona. Arizona has great charging order protection. It's statutorily the only ex exclusive remedy in Arizona. So they do not break into limited partnerships and foreclose on the underlying assets. You can include your family member in the holding company. You can include your kids, your spouse. If you have partners that you work with, it's a great way to create a family asset. And if you want, we can actually make this private. You don't need it to be private, but it's easy to make private if you want it to be private. So it's very difficult for someone to look up what you hold. After that, that's when we look at the asset protection trust. And don't worry, I'm going to go back into this in more detail, but at a high level, this is where we are taking the assets and creating the capacity to move them literally out of the country if necessary. And Brian mentioned that this is basically at a million dollars worth of net worth and protectable assets, whether it's limited partnership interest, direct real estate that you own, your primary residence, cash, stocks, whatever it is, once it adds up to a million bucks, we start looking at the asset protection trust. It's not limited to any specific type of risk. It just protects the asset. And again, privacy. I really want to talk about the asset protection trust because this is the thing that there's a lot of misunderstanding, confusion, and misinformation on the internet about. So what is it? Really simply, it's called a self-settled spencer trust. All that means is that you creating it for yourself and you're putting spencer provisions in it. And what a spencer provision is, is it's a provision that exempts those assets from a creditor. So Says, hey, if a creditor is trying to reach these assets, don't give them to them. So there's two ways or two schools of thought in this. You can do a, an asset protection trust internationally, or you can do it domestically. Talk about both. The international option was created first, created in 1984, so over 36 years ago, so a long time. It has statutory non-recognition of any other country's court order or judicial proceeding, which means if you get a judgment against you here in the United States and you take it down to the Cook Islands, it's literally worth nothing down there. You have to start the case all over again. You have to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt, which as we all know is very, very difficult to do. There's no contingent fees down there, unlike here where every plaintiff's attorney works for the action, that's a statutorily prohibited. You're not allowed to do that. Once upon a time in this country, it was also considered unethical until the trial lawyers got a hold of the legal system and remade it in their image. You can't amend your claim in the Cook Islands. And if you do lose, which you're almost certain to lose because you're not going to be able to prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt, you're going to pay the fees and the cost of the winner. So bottom line with this is that it's incredibly difficult. Oh, by the way, you're probably not going to be able to even file your claim down there because the statute of limitations will have run by the time that they get around to filing the claim. So what's the advantage of the international option? Effectiveness. I mean, it is just incredibly effective. What are the drawbacks? Why don't I use this every single time? Well, one, you're going to give up control of your assets to a trustee offshore. Not everybody's ready to do that. The costs are significant, not just the setup costs, which can run thirty to $50,000 to set something like this up, but the annual maintenance costs can easily run $10,000 a year because of the accounting, and that gets to the third drawback, which is compliance. The offshore trust has to have a fair amount of IRS compliance each year. So again, you know, these things are, there's no extra taxes, but it is expensive and you do have to raise your hand with the IRS. So what about the domestic option? This is newer. They came around in 1998. So about 15 years after the Cook's Trust, Alaska decided, let's give it a shot. Once Alaska has passed the statute, a bunch of other states jumped on board, definitely Nevada and Wyoming and Delaware. So today we have 16 U.S. states for the past some form of domestic asset protection trust uh, legislation. That's the, the DAPT, right? What people call it, domestic asset protection. Yeah, I think exactly. a, lot, a lot of That's people what... use Nevada. I think mine's a set up in Nevada, but wh why do people use that state or? Yeah, so Nevada got really behind the DAPT, the domestic asset protection trust. And so they've been very good about trying to amend their statute and keep it as current as possible and keep it as aggressive as possible. So if you're going to use a domestic asset protection trust, Nevada's considered the best day. The problem is, is that it's really only applicable to Nevada residents. So you may think, oh, we can just go in and use Nevada trust. It doesn't really work that way. And that's one of the disadvantages. And that's why 
they haven't worked much of the time. In fact, they don't work most of the time when they're actually tested. They work as a deterrent if you never really test them. But if you get down to the actual nuts and bolts of attacking them, they're not something I would feel comfortable with. Yeah, I'll so jump in there's enough nuts and bolts of that going a little bit deeper. The advantages are they're less expensive. You know, they're easier to do. They're not international. You don't have to be as skilled to work with a trust company here and get the documents and make them. And there's less compliance because it's not a foreign trust. What are the disadvantages? They fail. They have consistently failed. They keep failing. The first time it failed, I said, oh, this is going to happen a lot. And it has since that <laughs> has happened. And you have to give up even more control than you can imagine, even to attempt to make a death work. The reason is, is because Doug was saying is that these specific statutes are just created for the state residents. And so if you're a California resident using a Nevada Asset Protection Trust, the courts are just going to say, well, you're not a Nevada resident. Why do I care? And you're seeing this statewide now. And so we have cases like Bately versus Mortison. And this was actually an Alaskan resident using an Alaskan Domestic Asset Protection Trust. And the courts are using 10-year drawback um, provisions now that are attacking the DAP's um, assets. And they're just completely failing now. And then we have another case, Inre Hubber, same thing. The courts completely pierced through an out-of-state domestic asset protection trust, and the trust completely failed. A big one, Kielker versus Steelman. This was a California resident using that Nevada Asset Protection Trust. The courts used the 10-year look-back period, and he created this four years before he ever was sued. And you're starting to see activist judges, and this is what this court specifically did. They're just starting to go rogue. They don't follow case law, and they're actually starting to use public policy to right wrongs that they feel they need to justify themselves. And so this court created a new complete legal standard called a reasonable foreseeable creditor standard that's never existed before. And so now if you're doing business or you're owning something, you have to think about, oh, hey, do I have a reasonable foreseeable creditor that's going to possibly reach me down the line, which is an impossibility to consider. And so this is a lot of the weaknesses that we have. And so this is just case law backed. And so I want you guys to just understand this is what we're seeing in the trend continuing. It's just not us talking about something. We do everything strictly case law compliant. Yeah. So it's great that they exist. It's great that 16 states have acknowledged that asset protection is a valuable and legal concept. They just don't work so well. So the question that I asked myself was, I want to be offshore. I want my clients to be offshore, but I know that most of them are probably not going to need to use this. They're probably, if this is a safety net for just in case and to have maintenance costs of seven or eight or ten thousand dollars a year and to have to file the IRS compliance every year is a pretty big burden just in case. So my question was, is there a way that I can have offshore protection when I need it, but not have the compliance and the cost until I need it? And the answer is the bridge trust. So it's really a hybrid between domestic and foreign. So it's offshore protection with domestic simplicity. So what it is, is it is an offshore trust. It's a full offshore trust and it's registered offshore and it has an offshore trustee in a standby role. And then for the purposes of the IRS, it is brought across the bridge and it's domesticated. So from the IRS perspective, it is a U.S. trust. It's a domestic grantor trust, the simplest type of trust to maintain. Because of that, there's no IRS Form 3520A, which are the two compliance forms that have to be done every single year for a foreign trust. You don't have to file a FinCEN or the Foreign Account Tax Compliant Act disclosures. There's no IRS filing report requirements of any kind because it's a domestic grant or trust, just like a revocable living trust. Same type of tax treatment. Your assets can remain in the U.S. with your current bank inside of your holding company, inside of your Arizona Asset Management Limited Partnership. You don't have to have that foreign trustee in an active role. They're there, but they're domestic. I mean, they're standby. They are not actively in control of your assets. You can be your own trustee. And this is probably the point that my clients like the most is that they're their own trustee of their asset protection trust. And it's completely tax neutral domestic grant or trust. So how to test when we look at the four things we want, was it effective? Yeah, it's, it's a completely effective because if we ever use it, we declare an event of duress, the assets cross the bridge, the U.S. jurisdiction is dropped completely, and it becomes a fully foreign trust, a Cook Islands trust with all the protections of the Cook Islands. So it is completely effective. Control, you get to remain in control of the trust unless we get to that point where we have to trigger the trust and cross the bridge. Cost, much more reasonable. It's only a couple of thousand dollars a year to maintain this type of trust versus eight to $10,000 a 
year and less to set up. And then compliance, there's none. There's no IRS forms of any kind unless or until we have to cross the bridge. That's when we're going to have some compliance. But at that point, I can tell you, if you've got a serious enough threat where we need to be in a foreign trust, you are going to be happy at that point to pay the compliance and file the forms and do all the things because then we're using the protection. Is this trust irrevocable or revocable? Yeah, great great question, Lane. So it is irrevocable. Now, let me explain what that means. When you make something irrevocable, you cannot revoke it. Revoke means just completely say, okay, it's no longer in existence. What irrevocable does not mean is unchanged it is actually, this trust is extremely flexible. So it can be amended, it can be modified, the assets can be distributed from it completely. So the effect can be as good as revoking if we need to. So if I have clients that have had this trust for over 20 years, you know, they retire or, you know, their asset profile goes down, they give all their assets to their kids, they're doing some pre-Medicaid planning, whatever it is. And they say, Doug, I don't need the trust anymore. It's no longer, I'm not out of that stage of life. Can we get rid of it? And the answer is, yeah, we can absolutely get rid of it. We can distribute the assets out of it. Once it's empty, it can be dissolved administratively. It can't be revoked, but it does not mean it's not changeable. If it weren't revocable, Lane, if it was a revocable trust, if it weren't irrevocable, then we have a real problem from an asset tax standpoint, because then a court can just command you to revoke trust in the trust. You said an important word there, duress. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not the lawyer here, you guys are, but say I get sued at that point i'm in duress so we're gonna take this trust international and i don't own it so i'm kind of arm's length maybe you can kind of talk about how irrevocable thing kind of protects me that i'm not the one controlling or it won't pay out to me to pay out to my creditors right so irrevocable means you don't have the power to revoke the trust once the protector which is a role inside the trust person or company that is assigned the job of great event of duress. And that duress is a discretionary duration by the protector that they feel that the assets are risk. So we'll service the protector. In a typical case, client would call up and say, I'm being sued, it looks bad. The attorney doesn't think it's going to turn out well. I think very comfortable. We get time to say, okay, let's declare an event of duress. We declare that event. That causes that standby trustee to become the active trustee of the trust. And then they do a couple of things. One, they remove the client as a trustee. So the client is not doing this. He's being removed per the terms of the trust. Two, they decide to drop the U.S. jurisdiction of the trust. So they are no longer considered a U.S. trust. Now it's a fully foreign trust. And then three, they're probably going to demand the assets be distributed from the limited partnership, which they have the power to do under the Arizona statute, which is another reason we use Arizona, and take steps to place those assets away from the U.S. court altogether. So what that happens, if you end up in front of a judge and they say, hey, Lane, you know, we just saw a whole bunch of money. We think you have it. We think it's your money and you got a judgment against you. We want you to get it back. You won't actually have the power to get it back because you are now just a discretionary beneficiary and you're at the mercy of the offshore trustee as to whether you can get your money back. And the terms of the trust clarify to the offshore trustee that if there's any risk to distributing money to you, like a creditor is standing there or a court is demanding it, that that trustee is not going to distribute any money to you. So that's why it's important that it's an irrevocable trust. It is still part of your estate, though. This is still your asset. So a lot of times when people think about irrevocable trust, they think about trusts where they're, they're not a beneficiary, where they are completely have given their assets away. This is different. It's an irrevocable trust in which you are still the beneficiary of the trust. Yeah, and I think it brings up an important teaching lesson here. The goal is to control everything but own nothing for liability. <laughs> right. You got your assets in your home as home equity or paid off homes. You're like a sitting duck because everybody knows where all your stuff is at. Yeah. Let, me, let me piggyback off of what Doug was saying with that is one, all of what Doug just said is backed by, it's called the U.S. First Grant case. And this is where this wife's husband died on her and they had money overseas in an offshore account, Cook Islands. And they, you know, the husband died stiffing the IRS for like, I think it was like 36 
$1.6 million. And they tried to sue her three times in the Cook Islands. And to her credit, she tried to get the money back to the government. And the offshore trustee said, like, sorry, you're under duress. We're not going to do it under duress. And so the IRS, you know, as actually the SEC tried to ask the court to hold her in contempt and like, hey, sorry, we're not going to do it. She tried. She just can't do it. And so that's the power of it is once the control gets moving out of there, it, that's where the strength kicks into her. Even if you wanted to under you know, the government, the man coming after you to take your money, you're going to settle these cases for pennies on the dollar because it's safe and secure. And I think the next logical question would come from that is, you know, and I know from talking with you, Lane, it was a good question that you had. Does crossing the bridge create a fraudulent transfer? And so I think we should just answer that question because it's the logical place for it. That. Right. When I stress tested this amongst the other lawyers I knew, again, they were not in asset protection. They're more general. Yeah. They use the FT word, fraudulent transfer, because yeah. maybe maybe talk define that just for people to get an understanding of that. Sure. Yeah. So what a fraudulent transfer is, is it's a transfer, which is very important to understand what a transfer is. A transfer is a legal title change. So if I give my car to Lane and I sign the title over to him, I have transferred the car. If I drive my car over to Lane's house and say, hey, use it for the weekend, I have not transferred my car. So there's a, it, it's a legal distinction. You have to legally change title to the assets for this definition to apply. So a fraudulent transfer is a legal title change with an intent, which is a mental state of mind, to delay, hinder, or defraud a creditor. That's what a fraudulent transfer is. And if a court deems that you have done a fraudulent transfer, the remedy is that they can reverse the transfer. In most states, it's not a criminal act. It doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. So it sounds very scary because they use the word fraud and fraud is a very, very serious thing. This is not fraud on the court as it would be defined for a fraud case. It really should be called improper transfer. California has actually renamed their statute voidable transaction, which is a much more accurate name. It's actually just a voidable transaction. If the court deems that you have transferred the property with an intent to delay, hinder, or defraud a creditor, they can void the transfer and bring the asset back. Yeah. And so how this applies to crossing the bridge. So a conveyance happens when you actually change ownerships of the asset. And so at the point, if and when you ever would have to cross that bridge, most clients never do. So that's a good thing. There's not a change in ownership because the bridge trust was, it already owns the assets right from when we created it. You already have the foreign offshore asset protection trust and the domestic. It's all one. It's just called the bridge trust. And so when you cross the bridge, there's no conveyance whatsoever. All that conveyance happened right in the beginning into the bridge trust. Right. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to do this planning before you have a problem. Because if we do it today and we set this up in 2019 and we make all the transfers, that's when the transfers are going to occur. So your LLC interests are going to go into the asset management limited partnership, which in turn is owned by the bridge trust. So the bridge trust is getting all the transfers in 2019 when you don't have a problem. Then in 2025, you have a problem. Now the bridge trust says, hey, I'm going to take all my assets. I'm going to take my toys and go over here and play. I don't like playing over here because you guys are risking my money. That's not a transfer. The bridge trust has owned all those assets since 2019. So it's not a fraudulent transfer either because in 2019, you didn't have that creditor. So it's very important that if you're looking at this, it's better to do it early and build your assets inside of the structure versus waiting till you've gotten all of your assets and you're now you want to protect them. I'd much rather have somebody come to me when they have you know a hundred thousand dollars in their starting, then we can say, okay, let's layer into this, let's use the LLCs, and then we'll add the, the, the holding company, and then we'll add the bridge trust, then to wait until you have two million dollars and then come to me and say, hey. Uh, you know, I think I should protect it. Unfortunately, most people wait. They don't think about it. They didn't get the information. They don't have Lane to give a webinar on this. And so they never heard of it. Then they end up in trouble. And then they call me and they, the first thing out of their mouth is, I wish I would have known about this 10 years ago. Uh, all this fraudulent transfer is somebody sues you today and then you create an LLC tomorrow and you put all your titles into that property or a creditor sues you and now you're trying to hide bank account money into another hidden bank account. That would be right. Yeah. This example of a, of a fraudulent. That's a good breakdown. Explanation that you guys just gave. Why is it not a fraudulent transfer? You guys have to think for yourselves. Me personally, I'm kind of coming around to the idea. Yeah, it's, it's an important distinction. Now, here's the other thing <laughs> on this point. 
is once we've crossed the bridge, the court here doesn't have any power to void the transaction. They might say, well, you know what? We deem that a fraudulent transfer. We don't care. We're going to make up a new rule. We're going to deem it a fraudulent transfer anyway because we're trying to get a result. Well, that's fine, but the Cook Islands is not going to recognize that from a U.S. court. So even if the court here did deem a transfer that is not fraudulent transfer by definition, but they did it anyway, as Brian said, they make up their own rules all the time. Even if they did, they won't actually have any power to get the money back from the Cook Island. This leaves you in the driver's seat. Very important concept of asset protection. It's not about telling everybody to go pound sand. It's about putting yourself in a position where you can negotiate and you have leverage. It's all about leverage. This is the whole deal. We want our clients with the leverage so that if you do get into a scrape and you do need to make a deal, it's a deal on your terms, not on their terms. If your assets are all sitting, and available, then you're going to feel much more vulnerable. You're going to cut a much worse deal to avoid going to trial. Whereas if your assets are all protected, you're going to cut a much better deal or you're going to say, go to trial, go ahead. Even if you can win, you're not going to collect against me. I have seen this work so many times. It is so effective. I just wish everybody would realize the power of that because that's what this is all about. It works because law firms are businesses. The first thing I always had to do was assess, am I going to make my profit off of this You know, and my cost? And so I always had to understand what assets were there, what assets were available and not leverage. Where's the money coming from? How much is the case going to cost? And if I don't make a profit, my doors are going to close very, very soon. So people need to forget about the business end of law firms also. This attacks the business end of it. Yeah, we take away the incentive. What Doug is saying, most court cases, it'll be a settlement, right? What is it, 99% or something like that? I personally like the attitude of go pound sand, guys. If you guys want to sue me, first of all, you're going to have to find the lawyer that's license in the Cook Islands. I don't yeah. know if he's going to have to fly his butt out there, but he's definitely going to have to work off no retainer, right? Which is kind of what Brian talked yeah, about. Yeah, I use the go pound sand a lot. <laughs> well, I'd like to prepare everybody that it's about negotiation. There are definitely times where we tell them to go pound sand because that's the best possible negotiation tactic we can do. I mean, we absolutely use it all the time and it works. I mean, you know, it's just that strong. Yeah. And I think one of the, you know, it's not really about anonymity at this point because it's strong. And so if you are being sued, you know, you're like, here's my bridge trust. Here's my offshore Cook Islands account. If this were to get a judgment against me, you're not going to collect anything. Penny on the dollar. Goodbye. So let me put it all together. So I'm very visual. I like to see how things kind of work in a graph. So here's the asset management limited partnership. Put that in the center because that's your holding company. We also, then add to it your LLCs and make little houses out of the LLCs because they hold houses, they can hold boats, they can hold airplanes, any kind of asset that you value or that has enough risk that we want to isolate it. And then you have the bridge trust and then you have your estate plan, which is typically a revocable living trust. So how does this all fit together? Well, the limited liability companies are going to be owned by the Asset Management Limited Partnership. So they're going to be an asset of the limited partnership. What else goes in the Asset Management Limited Partnership? Your cash, your stocks, your bonds, your collectibles, your Bitcoin, your cryptocurrency, any kind of securitized asset is going to go in there directly. So the end game is that most of your assets are going to be in the Asset Management Limited Partnership. So who owns and controls the Asset Management Limited Partnership? Well, you control it because you're the general partner and the Bridge Trust owns it because it's the limited partner. So you have control and the Bridge Trust has ownership. This is where we get that fraudulent conveyance concept. The Bridge Trust already owns all these assets. So if you die, then we have straight up pass through the revocable living trust, all the bridge test assets actually pass down through the revocable living trust and they distribute to your estate. You maximize your estate tax exemptions, you avoid probate and the assets smoothly pass to your heirs. That's the most likely case. Or we have a real threat at which point the assets get demanded from the bridge trust and then the bridge trust takes whatever steps it deems prudent, which can include moving those assets actually offshore, physically offshore. That means we have opened up Swiss accounts, move assets to Switzerland, had the bridge truck 
go and pick up all your gold. And I have one client, he's got this ridiculous art collection worth several million dollars. And I remember distinctly the day we had the discussion about how we're going to have it all picked up by secure vans and, and taken to a secure vault in the custody of the trustee. So that if someone came, the sheriff came and wanted to collect all his art, it wouldn't be available. It wouldn't be there for him. And there'd be no way that they could force him to, to bring it back. So that's the concept. This was a really high level presentation. The best thing that Brian and I can do for you is really to, to individually talk to you about your specific situation. So I really would encourage you to call us. Usually there's a charge for an analysis, but for Lane and his group, there is none. So we will talk to you at no charge and help you understand if you want to just have a, a conversation about your specific assets, your situation, your risk, because everybody's different. This is just a very generic high level approach to it. So I hope that was helpful and definitely questions we'd be happy to answer. I got a couple. I'm just cruising through some of the chat. What if the majority of your assets are held in retirement accounts at the present time? Is this a type of protection that's needed? You're pretty much solid. If you're in a ERISA type qualified retirement plan, you already have asset protection because believe it or not, the U.S. government actually believes in this concept and they actually don't want to leave people destitute because guess who gets to support destitute people in retirement? The government. So retirement plans, particularly ERISA qualified plans, but also IRAs to some degree based on your state are already protected. So you don't have to use this type of planning if your assets are already in a qualified plan. Yeah, I was going to say like for the IRA part of it is, you know, it's state dependent. And so some will have great protection, yeah. some are going to have completely crappy protection, and they're not going to protect you for IRAs for, you know, it's always going to be a fraudulent or intentional act argument because that's an exemption for those protections from that. And then another one, what is the source of the risk that you think is the concern here? And I think one of the main concerns here is people don't know where they're going to get sued from. You can, it's the negligent things that come and bite you in the butt at the end of the day. A lot of times you loan out your car, the person is drinking and driving and T-bone somebody. You own a rental property and there's a fire or one of the renters holds a party and they get drunk. Someone gets drunk and kills somebody drinking and driving. Uh, you own a business. There's a lot of liability in owning a business that people don't even think about just from owning the business. You're a medical doctor and you're investing. Real estate investors have some of the highest litigation. It's like, I think the heaviest litigated area of law that there is. You can get sued from so many ways. And so the more you have, the more you know moving parts you have, the more concerned you're going to be about the litigation side of things and just the unknown. Yeah, that's the best answer. There, you have no idea what you can be sued from. Sometimes just having money is enough to get somebody interested in suing you. So my philosophy is just create as much of a barrier as you can so that you don't become the target. I got a question. So you got your houses, you're putting it in the lock there. You got them in LLCs. What right. is the lock? Is that an LLC? Is it an S Corp? What is? No, that's the Asset Management Limited Partnership. That's that Arizona holding company that we talked about. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what is the advantages of the Arizona OP. Yeah, so there's a couple of distinct ones. One, Arizona has followed suit with Nevada, Delaware, Wyoming, and made the charging order the exclusive and sole remedy against a partner in the partnership. So in Arizona, they will not foreclose on the partnership and go in and reach the underlying asset. So if you have a creditor, what happens is, is if your assets are in a, a limited partnership in Arizona, and that creditor gets a million dollar judgment against you, and you have a million dollars sitting in cash inside of this partnership, the court in Arizona is not going to say, oh, you got a million dollars, just give it to your creditor. They're going to say, oh, it's in a partnership. Sorry, Mr. Creditor, here's what we can give you. We can give you something called a charge against this member's interest. And so if there's ever a distribution, if, that's an if, there's ever a distribution, then you can get that distribution. But if there's not, you can't force a distribution and you can't get to the underlying asset. So that's very important. That's the whole point of a limited liability company. It's the whole point of the charging order. The other thing that Arizona has that's unique in my experience is they have a little section in their statute, which when I ran across it, I just thought, oh my God, this is the ideal way to connect the bridge trust. It's Arizona 29-333. And what it says is that a limited partner can make a demand demand for a unilateral withdrawal from the partnership upon the occurrence of a predefined event. And so what we do is we predefine the event as an event of duress. And so when that happens, instead of you as the general partner making the demand or, or making a distribution to the limited partner, which could be seen as you facilitating a fraudulent transfer, even though it's not a transfer, we have the trust itself make a demand. So it's just
just a great way when we cross the bridge to actually suck the assets out of the limited partnership. And so the net effect is once we cross the bridge, there's really no more assets in the limited partnership. It's there, but if they can go try to attack it, they won't really know what's in it anyway. It kind of acts as a red herring out there for them to try to spend their time and energy when they finally realize that, oh my God, it's been cleaned out and the money's all over in the Cook Island. So that's why I like Arizona. My office is in Arizona as well. So we can easily manage the thousands of limited partnerships that we have set up. And finally, there's one thing that is truly unique in my experience. Arizona, and only for limited partnerships, does not have any paperwork required or any annual fee. So once I set up a limited partnership in Arizona, unless I actively dissolve it, it stays valid. I had another guy call me and he had set up his holding company as a Nevada LLC, which is a common thing. I see it a lot. And he didn't pay the fee in Nevada. He'd gotten behind several years. He just kind of figured out there. Uh, and then he had to use it. And he called me. He said, Doug, uh, what do I do? And I, I looked at the entire structure he had set up with somebody else. And I said, you've got to revive this. And he goes, okay, can you do that for me? The bill for reviving his LLC was going to be $8,000. And even then we had the risk of a court looking at it and saying, well, it was defunct for five years and disregarding it, like Brian said in the beginning. That's a case where the corporate bail was very likely to be pierced. So just not having to worry about that in Arizona is a huge factor for me because I, I know my clients are never going to have an inadvertently dissolved holding company because somebody didn't file a form. And so, you know, the big elephant in the room question, you know, what's the cost of this? And so the pricing is fixed. The bridge trust costs $23,000 and then the AMLP costs six thousand so together that's twenty nine thousand dollars and then you can choose to pay fifty percent retainer and then the balance when the documents arrive if you want to go that route if you pay up front we generally give a ten percent discount and then another really good question kind of like on the nuts and bolts of the details of it this is from Jeff but all the assets need to be transferred into the AMLP so the entity is the owner, correct? The AMLP is the majority ownership. That's like where you're gonna, the control, the holding zone. What's gonna be the owner is the bridge trust the minority share of the AMLP. Right. The AMLP is going to own the actual assets. It'll own the interest in the LLCs. It'll own the bank accounts, but it in turn is owned. So it's just a subsidiary of the bridge trust. So the ultimate owner, as Brian said, is the bridge trust. That process, is that pretty simple? You just, if you have rental properties, you retitle it into the LP. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you retitle the rental properties. They should be in an LLC first. So they probably already are for most of your people on this call. You've already done that part. So then all we have to do is change the member of the LLC to the AMLP. Okay. And that is very simple cool. to do. What about LP investments that you have in your personal name? So um, those you'd want to switch to the AMLP as well. So if you did a bunch of LP investments in your personal name, you would just switch those. You'd call up the, the manager of the LP and ask them to switch it. Here's a good question. Are banks or lenders going to under, even understand this setup when they're applying for loans? And do you think that this is going to essentially affect their ability to you know, get loans? If there is an issue, you know, we, we can jump on the phone and talk to them, but it's just like any other asset protection system. Banks just generally want to know what it is that you have. Not like what you own, but just what the system is and that is for asset protection. It's kind of like having you know, an LLC with a land trust. You just say, hey, I got an LLC for, in a land trust for asset protection. I'm like, oh, okay, we get it. Yeah, I mean, here, here's my experience on that. It is that banks have gotten very sticky. And oftentimes I see clients that have just their home in a revocable living trust, which is the most vanilla thing you could possibly do. And the banks want you to take it out, get the mortgage, and then put it back in. I have tons of real estate people. By and large, this doesn't create any real issues. It's just that we do have to sometimes take extra steps. So if you're used to buying properties with the bank and you buy them in your own name and then you transfer them to the LLC, if that's the way you've been doing it, we're going to tell you to continue that because that's the way. Yeah, I say the only issues I've seen is with individuals going to a private lender with a private attorney who doesn't even understand anything about asset protection or LLCs at all. That's the most difficult situation I've run across. Yeah, but generally my real estate clients have not had any big problem at all. I got another question. When I was doing my due diligence on this uh, structure, another issue that I saw come up 
it's not really has anything to do with the structure, but let's just say you get sued and we're going to take it across the bridge to the Cook Islands or wherever. There's some scams out there for like, you know, like when the money goes overseas that it goes to a, not a, a trustworthy third party. What are some ways we can protect again? Well, Lane, that's the best question ever um, because if you uh, transfer your money to protect it to somebody who's just going to take it, then you didn't, you didn't do your job. So the answer is, is that when you transfer your money, it's only ever going to go to a real bank. Like we're talking a Swiss private bank that is completely unrelated to the trustee in the Cook Island. You're going to have a relationship with the banker. I mean, you're with the bank directly. So the, you are the UBO, which in banking terms means underlying beneficial owner. The bank is going to do their due diligence on you personally, and that money will never leave the bank without your approval because the bank knows that you're the UBO. And even if you're not the legal title holder or even the signer on the account, which you wouldn't be in the case of those offshore trust company in control of it, the bank is never going to let that money out of their sight without your explicit approval. So, you know, it, it, unless you're crazy enough to send your money down to somebody's wiring structure that you don't really know who they are. In our model, you're never going to lose sight of your money. I make sure that not me, not the trustee offshore, not anybody do I really, really trust. The only person I really trust with your money is you. I'm going to make sure you are always the one with your eyes on your own money. Yeah. And so when these are drafted properly, there's internal checks and balances that are created within the trust itself. And so like Doug was saying, it involves a trustee and then a trust protector looking over the trustee and then you, the client looking over the trust protector. And then at the end of the day, the bank that you choose, then they have built in delays and, you know, like client consent requirements before they can even transfer anything whatsoever. And so the effect of this is that virtually it's going to be impossible to make any kind of move without you knowing about it. Well, not even just knowing about it, approving it in the case yeah. of your money leaving the bank. If your money is going to leave the bank, you are going to have to approve it. You're going to get a phone call. It's going to be somebody you know who knows you. They're going to want signatures from you, even though you're not a trustee. So, I mean, there's just no way I would send my money without knowing that I have that control, or I would advise a client to send their money without knowing they have that control. Another question, what are the re annual recurring costs to the AMLP and the Bridge Trust? Yeah, so the costs are fixed. And it's $2,100 per year for all of the maintenance on it, for renewing the trust each year offshore, which is required for, we serve as the statutory agent in Arizona for the partnership. We serve as the attorney. And once you're a client, we don't charge by the hour. So other than that annual fee, that's the only thing you pay. We do annual minutes each year. We do annual meetings. And as much as you need to call me for questions, um, I, I had a client call me tonight, just wanted to ask a question, took five minutes, but you know he got his answer right away. He knows what to do tomorrow when he gets into the office and we get it right without you worrying about the bill. If I talk to your CPA, if I talk to your advisor, your financial advisors, whoever, I'm never going to bill for that. So it's very simple. The only additional tax return you have, which is your only other cost in this whole structure is a tax return done by your CPA is for the holding company, for that AMLP, that Asset Management Limited Partnership. And that's a very straightforward 1065 return. If you have an LLC that's multi-member, you're already used to doing that return. The exact same return as a multi-member LLC has to do. Why the Cook Islands? Or what are some other the other areas you go for? to go across that bridge. Yeah, okay. That, I mean, that's a great question. So so we talked about the international and domestic. So we decided if, if we're really in trouble, we definitely want to be international. Then the question is, well, where international would be the best? So Cook Island is considered the premier jurisdiction for a couple of reasons. One, they were first. They literally invented this entire area of law. They drafted and passed the first statute, which allowed for this to occur. And since then, we have about 24 other jurisdictions jurisdictions that have jumped on board, everybody from the Bahamas to Nevis to Grand Cayman. And the issue with them is that they're all kind of Me Too jurisdictions. They're also jurisdictions that all have another source of revenue. They, all, they do banking, they do insurance, they have tourism. The Cook Islands pretty much has asset protection. That is its industry. I mean, it has developed to become a huge huge part of their economy. It is extremely important to the Cook Islands. And not only were they first and therefore had almost all of the initial cases come through the Cook Islands, but they have continued to evolve their statute, pass new statute, pass amendments, 
and improve it to make it better and better. So in my opinion, they're just the best jurisdiction because of their level of experience and the fact that they are very proactive in making sure that this works. If we ever get a case that flat out fails in the Cook Islands, I can promise you they will no longer be the premier jurisdiction. Their incentive to keep, to not have that happen is just massive. I like that. I like to be hedged that much with my clients. I want the Cook Islands rooting for my clients as much as I'm rooting for my clients. Yeah, and, and you can sit there and, you know, through the cases of these being challenged in the Cook Islands, you can say that. But if you go to like Panama, Bahamas, or, you know, these other areas, you can't. You can get a cheaper offshore asset protection trust in the Bahamas, but then what happens when your suit is, oh shoot, now we've got to go create that Cook Islands one because now we actually are under fire and we need one that actually works. And so that's the other caveat of it. I got another question. Before you guys are going to fix my asset protection, I spent like 14 grand setting up this elaborate equity stripping scheme. Can you explain yeah. that to the folks, what, what that is and why that doesn't really work? <laughs> okay. I mean, my money just um, didn't go to nothing, did it? <laughs> well, okay. So equity stripping is a concept which says if you don't have any equity, then they can't take it from you. And that's true. So if you go to the bank and you strip equity out with the bank and you don't have any equity and you take that money from the bank and you put it somewhere safe, equity stripping absolutely works. The problem with the way a lot of people have converted it or perverted it is that they say, okay, great, well, let's just do that, but we don't want to use a real bank and we don't want to use a real transfer. We're going to have you set up your own company. Let's use Wyoming because they don't, they have a privacy statute so that no one will know it's you. And then we'll have that company put a lien against your property. And therefore, we're stripping the equity out of it. The problem with that is that you haven't stripped the equity out of it. All you've done is record a lien. That's all you've done. There was no transfer of real cash value for that lien. And when you're sitting in a debtor's exam after you've gotten a judgment against you and they ask you to, under oath, explain who this company is and who you dealt with when you got that loan, and they find out that you actually own that company, then that loan will just evaporate. And so equity stripping done with your own company in another jurisdiction, pretending that it's not you, is at best a little bit of privacy, at best. It's just a little tiny shield of privacy, but that privacy doesn't go very far in a real lawsuit. And uh, Brian can tell you as a litigator that he would shred through that in, in just about two seconds. The nut of it really comes down to you're getting friendly loans. And no matter what judge I ever go to or mediator or you know arbitration, it doesn't bolster the case. It really looks bad and doesn't pass the smell test. And so because you're using these friendly loans, a judge is just going to say, sorry, that's fraudulent. And we're going down the creek the wrong way. What you want is the system and the structure in place to where if you ever had to go and strip the equity and move it, you know, that's the last piece of the pie that you need to have. You don't need to go that far generally if you have a system that we're talking about in place already because the system is going to protect you already. If you were completely sued, your hair is on fire, you know, Doug and I talk and we're like, yeah, this is just going bad really fast. Then all you care about at the end of the day is not even what you own, but just getting all your assets out. And so we would just fire, sell everything, strip all the equity out and then transfer everything over, create um, Swiss bank accounts, and that's where that would go. But that's the last piece of the pie that most people don't ever need to go to that stage. And so I also see it as a loss of potential use of your equity, You know, especially if you're investing and you want to use it. Now you've tied up with friendly loan on there, and now if you ever want to use that equity, now you're going to have to then pay off your friendly loan, and it just creates more problems. So I would say it's a great idea and concept that people have. It's the last piece of the pie when you're talking about protection that's needed. Needed. And if you are to ever be challenged, the court is going to look at it and it's just not going to pass the smell test unless you get a fair market value loan. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, we got a couple other questions here. Will I need to set up a foreign bank account just in case my trust needs to cross the bridge? Or do you set that up after you're in duress? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you do not need to set up a foreign bank account now. There are some costs to setting up a foreign bank account. There's some changes in the way you have to deal with foreign banks. They're much more private banking style. There's some minimum sometimes that you have to meet to open an account. And most of my clients do not set one up just because they don't need it. They don't want it. They're happy with their money, their money where it is. I do have some clients that they actually want a foreign bank account. They have some concerns about things on this side of the fence and they just want to have some diversification. If you want it, 
it's totally fine to do. But if you don't, if it's not really applicable to you, then you don't need to do it. We can set it up after we cross the bridge. That's totally fine. And that's the, how we do it most of the time. And the follow-up to that, what countries are best for that bank account? Yeah, for the bank account, it's, it's really Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg. Um, we're talking about the European Banking Center, the private banking center. This is where just massive amount of global wealth is. It's not private in the sense that we used to watch James Bond movies with, you know, Swiss private numbered accounts or the firm, you know, John Grisham with the numbered accounts. That doesn't exist anymore. All accounts are transparent. They all report to the IRS. So sometimes I get clients say, oh, I've heard about when you take your money offshore, you don't have to pay any taxes until you bring it back. That is completely untrue. You have to pay taxes on all the money you earn anywhere in the world that you earn it. Even if you earned it on Mars, if you go mine an asteroid, you're going to pay taxes on that profit that you earn on the asteroid if you're a U.S. citizen or resident because the U.S. taxes on the worldwide income. So it doesn't matter where you earn it. So it's not about hiding from the IRS or even deferring taxes. It's simply about protection because those banks do not have U.S. branches. They don't have any U.S. any way a U.S. court can get jurisdiction over them. And so from a purely asset protection standpoint, they are extremely solid. And from a banking capitalization standpoint, they are much more solid than the banks that we're used to dealing with here. We think our banks are the best in the world, but they're not. They're not even close. Our banks are underfunded radically because we use fractional reserve banking, whereas the Swiss banks are not. They don't use fractional reserve banking. They actually make the banks hold your money. That's why Swiss banking costs more. They actually don't pay you interest to hold your money. You pay them interest to hold your money. That's how they make their money. You actually pay them a reverse interest rate. It's usually anywhere from a third of about to a half a percentage point just to have an account at a Swiss bank. But what you're getting for that is security level that you can't be achieved domestically. I've got an interesting question here. So say you're going to get married and you set one of these entities up. Is it technically you don't own anything at that point? So if you happen to get divorced, can't get the rest or hit the rest button in comments on this? Yeah. So no, you, technically you, it's not that you don't own anything. It's that you own separate assets. So if you are going to get married and you have assets and you want to make sure that they are not subject to the divorce, this would absolutely be appropriate for you. But it, it doesn't mean you don't own them. It just means that they are completely separate assets and that in a divorce, as long as you keep them separate and you don't transmute them by transferring them into your spouse's name, then in the divorce, then your spouse would have no access to them. So if the say, court disagrees. As I say, if you're going yeah. to get married, have a prenuptial yeah. with it and it would strengthen the system even more. Yeah, someone just said like prenuptial on the is a way to strengthen the system, but there's community property and separate property. And it, you don't want to commingle your assets. And anything you start accumulating during that marriage is going to be deemed community property. And so uh, the next question, like, oh, I want to get in the divorce. Is this going to protect me from having to give my spouse that I'm divorcing assets? No, you know, is community assets, um, what's community is community. And you're going to have to go through the court system to determine who gets what. But there's ways that you can structure and we can work through the system to protect the individual assets, the separate property. And so there's ways to work it within the system for that. So if, if you're going to do this and you want to keep that separate property you don't want the future spouse's name on the trust or how do we ensure like if you are married and then transfer them to them as it should we'll talk a little bit about that if you are married and you end up with a divorce i mean if you end up dying and you want the assets transferred then they're going to transfer because you're going to direct the bridge trust to pay to your estate and then pay to your spouse as long as you're married it'll transfer without any issue whatsoever if you get divorced though then of course you're going to change that and you're not going to leave your assets to your spouse and the and the planning itself will protect against the divorce. I will say, I think Brian's a thousand percent right. If you're getting married, I think a prenuptial is appropriate. It can do things that the trust cannot plan for, agree on alimony payments and agree on how you're segregating what would be otherwise community assets. And it gives great strength to the fact that you want to continue adding assets to your separate property asset protection plan. So I would recommend both. Some clients come to me and they go, Doug, I just can't do both. Like, I'm not going to go and ask. So we have to use just the asset protection planning. And in that case, I just say, you're going to have to be very strict. You need to basically close this plan down 
except for clearly separate assets, um, we can work around it. But a, a prenuptial is definitely in conjunction with the asset protection structure is the best option. What's your guys' opinion on the Series LLC? I know a lot. Of, we've been had a lot, having a lot of chatter on that. A lot of California folks are trying to get her on the LLC, eight hundred dollar charge. Okay, so Series LLC, it's a great concept. It says, "Hey, let's create an LLC, one tax ID number, and then we'll create a series, so that way you can have the separate protection, but just one tax ID number." I have a client who wasn't a client. He called me. He had a Series LLC. He had three properties in series all in California, each property was a million dollar property. One of the properties had a mold issue and it was a $5 million claim. It was gonna exceed his liability insurance by $4 million. And so he called me because he had thought he was all set and his attorney told him, hey, your other two properties are probably at risk. And so he called me in an absolute panic because he realized that the series was going to fail once it actually got tested. And so we had to do some fancy dancing last second to try to solve that situation. My opinion is if you care about asset protection and segregating the properties, I would not use a series LLC. If you don't care about segregating the properties, then a series LLC is okay, but you need to think of it as just one LLC from a liability standpoint. Even though the entire concept is that it's not one LLC, we don't have enough good case law that has supported that. Definitely not in California. It'd be a waste of a, of a series because then you just have an LLC. And the issue yeah. with it is I like them, but only if you live in that state that has series LLC legislation. And if the asset that you own is in a state that has series LLC legislation. Because if right. you're in one that doesn't have it, the court system say, we don't care. We don't have a series LLC. We don't recognize the series LLC. Wonderful. And that's the problem. They're just not going to recognize it. And we see it over and over again. And then, you know, like you're talking about the California franchise tag, you know, then you have what's called Delaware statutory trusts. But the issue with those now is they're being pierced is domestic doesn't have the power of the offshore and those are being pierced now. And so what you keep seeing is the constant pattern. Purely domestic is not full protection. I think the last one for close it out is what do you guys suggest for people net worth half a million dollars you know, to make a pretty decent salary, 100, 150,000 a year? Maybe this is overkill, but what do you guys suggest for that individual? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely, that's really a good time to start. Definitely if you have real estate, you're going to want the LLCs. Definitely the asset management limited partnership if you have that much in whether it's real estate or cash. You know, and whether you're ready to add the bridge trust right now or or not quite yet kind of depends on the speed of your of your accumulation and, and where you're headed. So, you know, you may or may not want to add the bridge trust or be ready for it, but definitely you'd probably want to add the first two levels and I would strongly encourage you to call and talk it through and just kind of look at your overall picture. It might be enough that we don't need the bridge trust for you right now. It's scalable and I was just saying you may not need that bridge trust component right now but the fact that you know about it it gives you a better projection for down the line of saying I might need it two or three years down the road so now how do I set this up and get into the network as I grow and then how do I grow properly and then it's get the properties out of your name get the LLC Maybe you need the LLC with the AMLP. And then you know that now I can bring in the bridge trust later on when I need it. And as Doug says it a lot, as funny as it may sound, you know, that 500,000 to a million dollar mark is actually, we get a lot of clients in that range because it takes a lot of time and energy and money for a lot of people to make that kind of money. And so they're scared rightfully of losing it everything. You know, I had one client the other day call, she has just at the million dollar mark, property manager and owns about four properties. And it took her a really long time, 25 years to get everything that she owned to that point. And she just wanted to make sure it was safe and secure. And she went to the bridge trust option, even though I was saying, hey, you know, let's scale you up, LLC, AMLP. And so it's just a matter of risk tolerance and where you are in your life and how concerned you are about where your risk is coming from. Yeah. And I'll kind of close this out. For me, I'm probably more risk intolerant in terms of like litigation, maybe because I'm, again, general partner in all these deals kind of out there, kind of target. Get, but there's no worse feeling than feeling like somebody can just do a frivolous lawsuit against you and then you know whether they win or not is one thing but just to tie up your assets and that mental bandwidth going to that individual who's just trolling you I you know if, if you had something set up like this and which is why I'm doing it 
you kind of laugh at that situation. You know, you get the pound your sand line you can use and you're kind of interested in see how it's going to work. It's kind of like taxes, right? If you do everything that you're supposed to be doing and you get audited, you should be, all right, this IRS agent's going to actually learn something from you. Yeah, it's a very empowering right. mindset. <laughs> I use that same thing I'm starting to use as a talk is no one's really interested in taxes until you start making money and then you love taxes. Yeah. Right? You start learning I mean, how to make more, make your money, make more money. And then like, oh shoot, I need to protect it. And then there's all of this new bubble that you need to start learning about. And then you get obsessed about asset protection, but it's the same thing, you know, with the taxes. I mean, I'm running out of stuff to buy, to be honest, for Krishna. And, <laughs> I mean, this is kind of exciting to me. <laughs> But if you guys have any more questions, feel free to shoot me an email or we'll post this up in the Mastermind channel. But you guys want to reach out to Brian or Doug, their, their email is up there, brian at btblegal.com, 503-773-0077. But any last words or you think we got it all, guys? I think we got it. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.